Welcome back, warriors. It's good to not see you, but hopefully be able to interact with you again later on today and throughout the week. Um, so welcome back for week three of our involuntary distance learning. Um, and we are going to continue with our discussion from Friday. So it is really critical that you have a good grasp, excuse me, my phone was rebooting there, I hope you didn't hear that, um, that you have a good grasp of the material from last Friday before we jump into today's discussion because really this is a continuation of Friday's discussion. So if you haven't already done it, do go back and do Friday's lesson right now. Do not wait um, and like do this one and then try to jump backwards. Your brain will not follow. Um, it will not go well. So go back and do that. Look back at your notes um, and make sure you kind of remember where we were. So we had dis started our discussion for this unit on political violence by first kind of wrapping our head around the notions of violence, force, and agency. And I had you watch a docu uh, documentary, a, a quick YouTube video that kind of delved into philosophical conceptions of the notion of violence. And in it, we heard of a couple of different ways of thinking about violence, particularly as violence as a means by which we eliminate the choices or agency of others. And that's a really interesting concept, especially when we think about it within the context of political violence. So we also discussed about that political violence is not the same thing as war, it is not the same thing as crime, and that there are different lenses of analysis that we can use to try and understand why political violence occurs. And on Friday, we discussed two of the three major lenses of analyses. We looked at institutional analysis of why political violence occurs. We have to think about things as like path dependent and structuralist. And then we talked a little bit about ideational reasons for violence. And we talked about that within the notion that ideas and philosophical principles or ethical systems or even religious justifications can provide kind of the diagnosis of a problem, the worldview and sort of the prescription to how you go about changing and fixing that problem. And it might therefore include violence. And in that sort of case, a system that kind of encourages violence as a solution to a problem sees violence not as a moral, not as unethical, but rather as the correct action in order to carry out um, sort of an, a much needed restoration of the world. The last type of analysis I want to look at today is an individual analysis of political violence. So when we talk about an individual analysis of political violence, what we mean by this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is that the explanation for why violence has occurred centers on an individual person who carries out the violence. And so instead of looking at like the structures that might have driven someone to violence, like looking at, say, capitalism or like, OK, if you are familiar with the story of Les Miserables, yeah, maybe, possibly the musical at least, like Jean Valjean is sent to prison for stealing a loaf of bread. Um, and he does it because his sister and their chil and her children are, are, are starving to death. And like the argument there is that the structures of poverty, the structure of um, economic inequality are what drives Jean Valjean to do this act. Now his crime is essentially nonviolent, but like if we're doing an institutional explanation, that would be kind of the way that we look at things. If we're doing an ideational explanation of violence, we might look at why a person chooses to act within the context of the ideas which they are exposed to. But individual explanation instead looks at personal motivation. They look at like, what's the backstory to this person and why they are doing what they're doing. And within that individual explanation, there are actually two major paths. We can either look at the psychological factors that may drive people to violent political actions, like 
Are there, is there violent action a function of their personal experience? Um, is there stuff in their background that is so incredibly like traumatic that they can't really get past it? And so therefore, like the worldview is kind of warped by these experiences. And so what we see as extreme action becomes rational within their personal context. Is it a result of broader societal conditions? Um, generally speaking, when we look at things like these psychological factors, that draw people into violence, we tend to contextualize political violence as an act of desperation. That this act is something that is carried out because they've essentially been the subject of violence themselves. That they have had their choices limited. They're backed into a corner. They have nowhere else to go. So obviously violence then becomes an option. So it is an attempt to restore meaning to a world that doesn't have meaning. That violence is kind of the last gasp of people on, uh, on an individual basis. Now, what I do want to make us very, very, very aware of right now is that the psychological analysis of political violence is not equitably applied to all people. Often, when there are violent acts carried out by minorities or by people of color, societal explanations or conditions, their personal backgrounds, the psychological factors as a result that, that lead to violent actions are not necessarily considered. Often, psychological factors um, being considered as a motivating factor for individual acts of political violence is a function of privilege, particularly if the perpetrator is white. Um, all you have to do is Google for a number of different stories and you will find these sort of things. Um, this link in particular I put up there um, because it's about, um, I don't know if you guys remember, there were um, bombings in uh, Austin, Texas several years ago. Um, and uh, they're really interesting in terms of the way that the guy who carried out those attacks um, was portrayed and the way people talked about him. Oh, he must be ill. There must be some sort of reason he wouldn't normally do this. But those sort of explanations are often influenced by context, by privilege, and by power. So sometimes what we see instead is a rejection of a psychological analysis. And instead, we emphasize that the individual has chosen violence not because they are unwell or because society has limited all of their other options, but because they made a rational choice, that they saw violence as a choice that they did not have to take and they chose to take it anyway. Instead, this analysis says that political violence isn't driven by despair, but rather by individual strategy. That a person has sat down, weighed the causes, weighed the consequences, weighed the options, and made this deliberate choice to use violence when other means were available. So this is still an expression of deviance. It's deviant social uh, um, sociopolitical behavior, but it is seen as a rational act in this context. And for some individuals who perpetrate political acts of violence, they will themselves contextualize their, um, their actions as rational acts, as strategic acts. Um, one in particular, I'm not going to go into great detail because it's very distressing to me, um, was a terror attack carried out by a, uh, a, a right-wing Christian extremist, uh, extremist in uh, Norway. You may have heard of this. Um, he attacked um, members of, of, of Norwegian government structures, and then he went to the island that you see there in the photograph, which was the site of a, um, a summer camp for um, uh, teenagers who were members of a, a sort of a left-leaning political party. Um, he went there dressed up as a police officer and then spent about an hour hunting the children on the island and, and killed a, a huge number of them. Um, he is in prison. He was convicted, obviously, of, of terroristic acts and murder, um, but uh, he he maintains that what he did was a rational act, that this was a moment of strategy. Um, he has expressed no remorse for it, um, and he is a uh, really disheartening example of the human, like, species. Um, so, like, the way that we tend to look at violence in a political context really depends on the act itself. So, one of the most important things that we have to do when we look at acts of violence is 
is we compare sort of these explanations and they almost all come down to free will questions. I know this gets like kind of theological, but we'll just roll with it here. Like to what extent are the people themselves the main actors in political violence. Well, depending on the way that we analyze the act of political violence, that being looking at institutional, ideational, or individual factors, it kind of winds up on a spectrum like this. <clears throat> where on one end you have like very little free will, like almost everything is sort of de determined by other things. We can kind of look at the philosophical basis of like determinism there, uh, um, <coughs> that you are acting not because you have chosen to act, but because you've been kind of forced there. Um, and then on the other side, you can look at total free will where everybody is making their own choices all the time and they really matter. So if we're looking at institutional explanations of violence, what we are really talking about is human beings having less free will in terms of their use of political violence because it's not necessarily the individual person that is going to make the decision to carry out an act of political violence but rather the institutions that kind of shepherd them in that direction um, whereas ideational <clears throat> Ideational explanations, there are institutional structures, be they, they could be like, you know, religious organizations, or they could be well-established philosophical principles that may uh, condone certain acts of violence. But it is ultimately the person themselves who decides to activate that idea and to act upon it. Whereas the last and most like problematic, perhaps, in terms of like figuring out how we read these actions is that if we look at individual explanations of political violence, then you take away everything else and you say, no, everything is down to individual choice. Um, that person chose to pull the trigger. That person chose um, to plant a bomb. They chose to do that. Um, and the big question then becomes like, how do you weigh the legal systems behind this? How do you, if your goal is to prevent political violence, like how do you do that when there be, can be so many different reasons why people act violently. So institutional explanations, like I said, tend to be much more deterministic, like there is nothing you can do to avoid this. Um, whereas individual explanations tend to be purely focused on individual people's choices. Ideas are influenced by institutions, but acted upon by individuals. It's sort of the middle ground. Additionally, when we compare explanations for political violence, we have to think, are we talking about this in a universal or a particularis particularistic sort of way? Is the violence caused by a specific condition right here, right now, that is only re reproducible in this moment? Like, are you perpetrating this act of political violence because um, the economic system has failed you, because you don't have stable housing, because your educational system has collapsed, because like, are there reasons that are particular to this moment, or are there psychological attributes that are common to all human beings that sort of like when you hit these particular buttons in human beings, you're likely to see political violence. For me, I tend to think that every historical moment is particular, but there are patterns that emerge. I mean, if you think about it, one of the things that I tell my students in world history over and over again is when you cannot feed your kids, generally speaking, something's going to give. Okay, if you think about the motivating factors of stuff like the French Revolution or the Haitian Revolution, like it's there's a breaking point there. There's a moment at which you cannot take another blow, and that tends to be the moment at which violence erupts. So, <clears throat> usually. These explanations, institutional, ideational, individual explanations, we don't use them in isolation, we use them in concert. We can look at things in layers, like here is the individual reason, the trigger event, why this person did this thing. Here is the ideational explanation for why they were able to mentally justify what they were doing. Okay, and here is the institutional background that is used to explain why they felt they had no other choice. I'm going to stop here and then move on to the next video. So take a moment, go back, write down the stuff you missed because I know I was talking fast.